Now, another saint for today, uh, Blessed Clara Isabella Fornari. Uh, she's an interesting saint. Uh, she was a stigmatist born in Italy in 1697, and she entered the Carmelites at age 15, took vows at age 16, and very, very soon she was um, given visions, ecstatic visions of our Lord, uh, St. Clare of Assisi, St. Catherine of Siena. And in one of these visions, uh, our Lord placed a ring on her finger and pronounced her his spouse of sorrow, which uh, would follow her the rest of her life. She received the stigmata, the visible stigmata at that time, and it would bleed periodically. And she had an, an invisible crown of thorns uh, that would, um, wounds would appear occasionally, and actually um, little spines of thorns would occasionally fall uh, from her head. Uh, so uh, an amazing uh, stigmatist, but you know it wasn't it wasn't easy for her. You know we we think that the saints that um, they're given these extraordinary visions, these extraordinary graces, uh, but they also have to make a choice, right? They also have to correspond with those graces, even extraordinary ones. And um, Blessed Clara, uh, it wasn't easy for her. She suffered at the end of her life or towards the end of her life, uh, deep depression and even despair. She was tempted to um, apostasy and suicide. And many saints um, have had these. And so the, again, these were temptations. Obviously she didn't succumb to, to, to them, uh, but she lost the vision at the end of her life. She lost the memories of her earlier visions and ecstasies. She had remembered that she had them, but couldn't remember the content or anything else. It, in fact, it appeared to her as if they had been childish fantasies of hers. Uh, so very difficult, difficult, uh, dark night of the soul for her. Uh, but not long before her death, um, our Lord uh, restored to her uh, the consolations she had had, the, the visions returned, her memory of them returned, her joy returned, and then God brought her uh, from this life into the next and when she was 47 years old. Uh, and, it, you know, that's, it's an interesting story there with, with her, um, her life of sorrow and, and even depression, right? God doesn't spare us from that. Uh, be, being a saint or being being uh, um, holy, uh, on the one hand, it doesn't mean you have to be depressed, right? Like we have this idea that the saints are gloomy, the saints are sad. But on the, on the other hand, um, sanctity doesn't prevent it from happening, right? Like there are people that just, uh, many people, that, that's one of those, um, most, I think, most frequent uh, diagnosed illness is depression in people. I mean, the further away you get from God, the further uh, down the tubes society goes, the more people are going to be depressed. But even still, even, even when you are living a good, holy, um, spiritual life, there's no guarantee God will prevent it from happening. It's a natural condition, like the humors of the, of the body and so on. Depression is something that just occurs. Just like people have to struggle against feelings of anger, feelings of lust, feelings of revenge, feelings of whatever it may be, some people have to struggle with feelings of depression. Uh, and so this, this is one of them. And, and so it's, it's, a great, it's a great lesson to us that, you know, it just might be something we have to deal with, but you can become a saint in spite of that, in spite of the fact that you just don't feel anything. You're just like, what's the point of life? What's the purpose? My whole life is a lie. You know, whatever I thought I felt before, it's gone now. She felt the same thing. She felt the same, the same way. Uh, but she persevered, and that joy, as I mentioned, was restored to her right, right at the end of her life. Right? It wasn't as if like, oh, just get through this. It, it's every, everything's temporary. You'll, you'll get through this. I mean, maybe you'll get through it 80 years from now, right? And we have to be willing to, um, we have to be willing to endure that. God just asks us to hang on. He doesn't ask us to be successful or, 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 or to, to be holy. He asks us to try to be successful, to try to be holy. He's going to do the rest. Uh, but now today, uh, St. Uh, Juan Diego uh, he was born in 1474. We may not realize how early Our Lady Guadalupe was, but yeah, 1474 was when he was born. And he was a native Mexican and is the first uh, Roman Catholic indigenous saint from the Americas. And his birth name was um, Aztec. Let's see if I can get this. Cuauhtlatoatzin was his name. That's, that's their, their language. And uh, he was an orphan at a young age. And he lived with his uncle, whom, who he raised. And although he was raised in that awful, horrible, uh, bloodthirsty Aztec religion, uh, he, he retained everybody, everybody who's born has a knowledge that God exists and God created the world and uh, that, that um, you know, we, we, we know him. Every, every single child is born has a knowledge that God exists, right? Actually, children are born theists 
and they become atheists uh, only afterwards. That's a perversion of, of children's natural knowledge. And I've mentioned this before, but it's worth repeating. Uh, you know, children always ask questions. Why, 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 why? And you say, well, you have to eat dinner first. Well, why? Well, because it's healthy for you. Well, why? Well, because you, you digest it. Well, why, why, why? Uh, and then, but if you tell children, like, why is the sky blue? You say, because God made it that way. They like, oh, okay. God made it that way. Like, that, they don't ask any more questions. Like, that's sufficient for children. That, that should tell you something. Like, they ask all these questions. When you get to the first cause, God made everything. Okay, he's the one that made it all. That's, that's enough for me. Anyway, so Juan Diego had this, uh, this spark of this mystical understanding of God at, at an early age, and he kept it throughout his life. And so when the uh, Franciscan missionaries arrived in 1524, uh, he and his wife were one of the first uh, to be baptized and convert to Catholicism. He would walk, he would make long walks to go to the Franciscan mission uh, to hear them. And he was in the lower class of society, a farmer, uh, very poor, and never had any children. And just a few years, um, four or five years after conversion, his wife would die and uh, he, would, he would remain a widower for the rest of his life. But on December 9th, today, in 1531, is when he received the first apparition of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And that feast is coming up on December 12th, and that's this Saturday. Uh, I'll speak more about, about all those apparitions then. Uh, but the result of that, right, the result of Juan Diego's apparitions, and it's really, actually, it's really funny. If you haven't read how he talks to Our Lady, it's hysterical. He's like, he gets caught by her. He tries to hide from her. He tries to go take a different route, and she catches him. And he's like, "Oh, uh, hello. How are you? H how's your health today?" Um, it, it just it is is very uh, down to earth. It's very natural. It's something that a a, a poor peasant, just a very simple, um, even even a um, I would say uneducated person would say, but but I, you know it adds to the authenticity. If you're going to make up a story about an apparition, like how do you make that kind of stuff up? Right? It's not like any of the other, that's the great thing, right? You read about the saints, their, their visions, their, their lives, they're, they're just, they are like other people, but they're not like it, right? There's these little details that are different, and that's exactly how real life is. So it, it's a mark of authenticity. And furthermore, so what happened afterwards? After, you know, the, the miraculous image on the tilma, bringing the roses to the bishop, and, and this caused a wave of conversions uh, because of his, his apparitions. In fact, uh, 3,000 Indians uh, in one day uh, received baptism. And then the next day, 3,000 more Indians wanted baptism. And then 3,000 more and 3,000 more. Every single day, 3,000 people were being baptized. For how long? How many days did that happen? Eight years. Every single day for eight years, 3,000 people were baptized. Now, I mean, not literally, but at the end of eight years, nine million Indians had converted. And, and this, was, um, this was in 15, let's see, uh, 1531 is when he started receiving these, these visions. Uh, f until then, uh, like 1492, right, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, and the missionaries started arriving, and for decades, there was already a bishop at that time. They, the conversions were hard. They, they weren't making conversions. The Aztecs were stubborn, they were resistant. Uh, but then after these, these apparitions, boom, nine million conversions in eight years. Uh, well, you talk about a difficulty uh, processing converts. Uh, that's, a, that's a tired arm right there, all those baptisms. Uh, but what did Juan Diego do? He moved into a little hut on Tepeyac Hill, and he lived as a hermit there for the rest of his life, in prayer and in labor. He didn't go around giving talks or conferences. He didn't write a book. Right? He didn't, he didn't, you know, he just lived poor and unknown. And he died 17 years later on 9 December 1548. To the day, the very day he received the first apparition is uh, when he passed on to God. Uh, so this is, um, this is mysterious, right? Uh, and, and it's been noted before that these, these miraculous conversions of, of 9 million Indians, and it, it, it endures to today, right? I mean, it, you get any Mexican... Um, uh, generally, I mean, up until, you know, the uh, um, Protestants have been, have been evangelizing their Mexico, but until then, everybody was Catholic. If you're Mexican, you were Catholic. That's what you did. Uh, everybody was Catholic, and it, this is the genesis. This is when it, when it started. Um, in the context, so in 1524, the Franciscans arrived there in South, um, well, Mexico. In 1521, Martin Luther had been excommunicated for heresy. In 1545, 
the Council of Trent was convened to deal with that um, a heresy, and uh, many, many, many Catholics in Europe were falling away to Protestantism. At the same time, many, many millions were, were, were arriving into the faith uh, from, from Mexico. Uh, so this is how God works, right? Uh, uh, to, to the prayers of the church, God grants uh, answers, maybe not in the way we expect, right? People were praying for the conversion, uh, praying, Lord, preserve your church, bring people back into the church, and the Protestants were falling away, right? And they, and they weren't even Protestants. Those people who, in 15, the 1500s, those were Catholics, those were apostates, right? That's what was happening. These people were losing the faith. They had the faith, it was weak, they hadn't preserved it, they fell away, almost kind of like the Jews who lost it through their own fault. And so God brings in the Gentiles. In fact, interestingly, read the gospel or read the epistle for this past Sunday. It's all about that. Is it God is the God of the Gentiles? He wants all peoples. And he goes through all the prophecies of how the prophets had said how God is going to bring in the Gentile peoples, the Gentile nations. Uh, so we see an example of that. God hasn't stopped doing that, bringing those into the church who never had it to begin with, because those who did have it lost it through their own fault. Is that, is that ringing a bell with anybody today, right? Sad, sad to say, the Catholic Church is just in a horrible state and we've done it to ourselves. Is it, we may have been betrayed from within uh, by either treachery or just laziness or whatever it may be. Um, so uh, we, we've seen this miracle. Uh, today we have the memory of that miracle of Our Lady Guadalupe. Prayers will be answered. Maybe not in the way we expect, uh, but God will always hear devout prayers. And he, he will bring people into the church. Either they'll be reconverted or, or they'll just be entirely new. They never had to begin with and they find it for the first time. And then, you know, like, like these Aztec Indians, millions and millions just poured into the church. Uh, please God, we have something like that uh, maybe in these days. Uh, but it is going to be prayer that accomplishes that. Prayer and sacrifice, hard work. Uh, let's do our part uh, to respond to the grace that we've been given and, and not waste it. Uh, God bless you all in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen.